This is a talk about a, um, a very basic uh, machine learning strategy. And uh, it's, it's meant to be uh, sort of uh, accessible. The, the, um, you know, the proof techniques and so on are uh, not terribly complicated. And uh, um, I'll basically be developing uh, the theory of this area from scratch. So um, <coughs> feel free to stop me um, at any time. Okay. So um, nearest neighbor is, uh, is one of the oldest and simplest approaches to classification. Okay, so the setting is that there is some training set of points, uh, points x1 through xn, and each of them has a label. And I'm just going to take these labels to be binary. Okay, so the labels are 0 or 1. Um, and this is your training set. And later, some query point comes up, some point x comes up, and you have to predict its label, whether it's going to be 0 or 1. Okay, so if it's helpful, one example you could think of is where the x's are uh, medical records of patients who have a particular disease. And why is whether this patient responded well to treatment or not. Okay? So you have a bunch of these medical records, and now this new person comes up. And you have to make a prediction. Are they going to respond well or not? And the nearest neighbor strategy is very simple. What you do is you take this new point, um, this dot over here, and you look for a few of its nearest neighbors. Okay? You say, oh, well, you know, it's close to these. This patient is close to these three guys. And they all responded well to treatment. So my prediction on this point is going to be 1. OK, so that's the nearest neighbor classifier. And uh, so it's nice and simple. Um, it's been used for you know, uh, 60, 70 years. And the question is, you know, how can we uh, formally characterize the performance of this method? Okay, how, do we, how do we understand? Uh, uh, and what kind of notion of distance do you have? So um, the, the notion of distance is typically determined by the application. So in the, in the medical example, you know, there would be some notion of distance between medical records that would be suitable for that domain. And I'll, I'll talk um, later about the particular formalisms that we'll be using. OK. So um, in order to understand this classifier, the first thing to point, about, uh, point out about it is that it's a non-parametric estimator, which means that as you get more and more data, the, the classifier itself becomes more and more complex. You have to keep all the data around. So this picture over here shows what the decision boundary might look like if you just have a small data set of about um, 16 points. Okay, So if you just have a small data set, you might get a boundary that looks something like this. Everything here it would say plus. Everything here it would say minus. Uh, but as you add more and more points, the boundary would get more and more intricate, typically. Okay, so the kind of questions that we'll have is um, expressivity. What kind of boundary can you produce in this way? And I think it's, you know you can see just from the picture you can pretty much get any boundary you like. Okay, consistency. So as you get more and more data, does this boundary converge to something? And if so, what does it converge to? And finally, rates of convergence. Okay, how quickly does this convergence occur? Okay. So these are the kind of questions we'll be looking at. So uh, to make things more concrete, first we have to pin down the data space. So the data point line, some space x. Okay? And in order to decide what's nearer and further, we need uh, some sort of distance function. Uh, most of the work on nearest neighbor has focused on the case where the points lie in a finite dimensional Euclidean space. Okay? Um, but there's also been a lot of work where you just say it's a metric space. And that's the setting that we'll also be taking, that it's a metric space. Um, but you know, one thing I'd also like to point out is that from an application's point of view, it's also of great interest to look at distance functions that are not metrics. A lot of the things people like to use will, you know, are sometimes not even symmetric, let alone. Uh, okay? so, so it's of interest to do that, and there isn't much theory on that. Okay? So, so we'll be looking at the metric space setting. Okay, so now you have this training set, and then you have and then you have future points. And why would the training set help you with future points? What is the connection between them? Okay? And the usual way this is formalized is what's called the statistical learning model, where you say the connection between the training set and future data is that they all come from the same distribution. We don't know what it is, but there's this underlying distribution from which all points are drawn. Okay? And this is what makes learning possible. Okay? So, um, so we have our metric space, and now uh, where, where our points x lie, and now we're going to say that there's some probability measure on that space from which we're going to draw points. So that's the x's. 
What about the labels? Okay. Uh, now, each label is either 0 or 1. So conditional on x, we'll say, uh, we'll use the notation eta of x to just denote the probability that the label is y given x. Okay, so just like, for example, in the, in the medical example, uh, what does eta of x say? It says, well, if you look at all patients whose profile is x, and you find that 80% of them respond to, well to treatment, then eta of x is 0.8, okay? So this is the conditional probability of, B of having a label 1 given x. So the way points are generated is you first choose x according to mu, and then you choose y conditioned on x according to this simple coin flip. Okay, So that's the data generative process. Now, um, what we are producing, what the nearest neighbor uh, method is producing, and what uh, you know, machine learning methods produce is a classifier, which is a rule that takes any point in x and then makes a prediction, 0 or 1. Okay? Um, and the quality of, a cla of the classifier uh, is judged by the number of mistakes it makes. Okay? And that's usually called its risk. So it's the probability that it's wrong on points from this underlying distribution. Now, the very best possible classifier is called the Bayes optimal classifier. And what is it? It's the one that for any point x looks at eta of x. And if that bias is greater than a half, it predicts 1. And if the bias is less than a half, it predicts 0. Okay, so this is the best possible classifier. And unfortunately, um, there's no way we can write this down since we have no idea what the underlying distribution is. So we can't just explicitly construct this. But still, it's something that we aspire to. Okay. Um, okay. Now the error rate of this classifier, what is the error rate of the best possible classifier? Well, on x, uh, if eta of x is, say, 0.8, it's going to predict 1, and it's going to be wrong 20% of the time. So its error rate on x is the min of eta and 1 minus eta, and the overall error rate is just the expectation of this over a random choice of x. Okay, so that's the best possible error rate, and what we would hope is that as we get more and more data, as n goes to infinity, our boundary or whatever classifier we're using has error that converges to this, okay, that reaches this. Oops. Okay, so, uh, so let's just go through some basic questions over here, and I'll just tell you what was known previously and, uh, and what we uh, figured out. And the work that I'll be talking about was published in two papers. One of them was five years ago. Uh, and uh, with Kamalika Chaudhary, and one of them is going to appear in a couple of weeks um, um, with Yoav Freund, uh, Akshay Bal Subramani, and Shai Moran. So the first question is, uh, for the nearest neighbor classifier, as the number of points goes to infinity, does the error rate of the classifier actually converge to the minimum possible to this Bayes um, error rate? And what was known previously is that the answer is yes in finite dimensional Euclidean spaces. And one of the things we did was to just extend this to a broader range of metric spaces. Here's the first result. Now, this is just an asymptotic result. Okay? In reality, you always have a finite amount of data. So what we care about is not just does it converge, but how fast does it converge. And in that case, um, it, for non-parametric estimation, it turns out that rates of convergence really depend on the smoothness uh, of the function. Okay? So this is, again, the coin flip probability, the bias at each point x. So this is going to be between 0 and 1. And this is a really nice setting. So this is, let's say this is a half over here. So on points x over here, you would always predict 1. On points x over here, you would predict 0. And you just kind of have to figure out where that point in the middle is. Very easy learning problem. This is the bad situation, because over here you should predict 0, over here you should predict 1, over here you should predict, you know, so it, it spikes up and down. And so it's clear, just from looking at the picture, that you're going to need a lot more data for this one than for that, okay? And so what's usually done is that people formulate some sort of smoothness assumptions um, on the underlying distributions, and then give rates of convergence um, that are in terms of these smoothness parameters, typically one or two smoothness parameters. And one thing that's been known for a while is that um, the optimal for one of these smoothness classes, the best possible rates of convergence are of this form. It's n to the minus 1 over p, where p is the dimension. And then there are some constants in here, like uh, 2p plus 3 or something like that. The constants depend on the particular smoothness class. 
Okay, so these are the rates of convergence. Yeah. So when you say neighbors neighbor classifying factor is uh, another parameter which is how many neighbors you take, right? I mean yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll pin that down later. This is just for the for the best choice. For the best choice, yeah. Also uh, for, for wines you're taking se several neighbors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you'll have to take several and in fact, um, as n grows you'll have to take more and more. Uh, I'm confused about how yeah. Confused yeah, yeah. So that's um so one thing we did, so this was known to be the best possible. One thing we showed is the nearest neighbor achieves this as well, OK? Um, uh, but um, what I would like to sort of emphasize over here is that although this is the best possible, this is actually a very bad rate of convergence, you know? Uh, so even when p is small, when the dimension is small, something like 20, the rate is n to the minus 1 over 20. What that means is that if you wanted to say half the error, you would need a data set that was two to the, like a million times larger. So that's a very bad rate of convergence. And of course, frequently nowadays, you have data sets where P is in the hundreds or thousands easily, right? So um, if this were actually the rate of convergence, like if this formula over here in any way reflected reality, there is no way in hell that we would ever use any of these methods, OK? <laughs> And so this must be wrong in some fundamental way. Um, and I'll tell you what the problem is. It's that the way the, the, way the problem is set up, um, you start by defining a very large class of functions that have some smoothness property. And then you say, you know, there are so many functions in here, but there's this one function that's problematic. That's the pathological case. And on that guy, this is the best you can do. But everything else, including all of reality over here, is actually much, much better. And somehow the theory doesn't give us a handle on that at all and ends up instead with these uh, very, very pessimistic bounds um, that are actually very forbidding, whereas these methods are widely used and work well and have rates that are not like this. Yes. Yeah, so even random. <laughs> Yeah, so even yeah, random might be bad, but you know, there's um, right. And so, so one thing that I've been interested in is getting uh, better, more accurate rates of convergence. And I think for many non-parametric estimators, it's very doable. And you'll, in fact, I'll try to give a sense of how easy it is. So um, the last thing I'll talk about is rates that are not minimax optimal over some large class, but are literally accurate for the specific distribution um, at hand and sometimes even for the specific query. OK, so these are the three um, things that I'll be talking about. Um, so let me start with consistency. And again, just please stop me at any time if, uh, if things are confusing. OK, so the most basic type of result, consistency. And before we answer this, we have to get to the question of how many neighbors do we take. And usually, there are three things that are distinguished. One nearest neighbor, where you just look for the very closest. Or k nearest neighbor, where you look for the k closest, okay, like three or five. And you just take the majority vote over their labels. Or a third situation, where you do the k nearest neighbors, but you let k grow with n. So k could be log n or square root n, something like that. It turns out you really have to do this, okay? Because the first two are not consistent. Okay, and I'll just give you a quick example of this. Simplest example is where for every point in space, there is, say, a 25% chance of a 1. Okay? You have a 25% probability that that person is going to respond. And so you should just predict 0 everywhere. And your error rate is going to be 25%. The one nearest neighbor, unfortunately, has got um, a much higher error rate. Okay? Because what happens in one nearest neighbor? You have the, the point at which you're trying to predict. You have the nearest neighbor. Each of them is a coin flip with probability a quarter. So the chance that they disagree is 2 times a quarter times 3 quarter, which is 3 eighths. Okay? And the same thing holds for k nearest neighbor for any fixed k. And so you really have to let k grow with n. And so that's what we'll do. Okay? So k goes to infinity along with n. Okay. So that's what we're going to mean by nearest neighbor. So the first set of results um, are consistency results under an assumption. And the assumption is that this coin flip, this, um, this bias, um, eta of x, is actually a continuous function. Okay? So it's under the assumption that this conditional probability function is continuous. 
And of course, we're going to let k go to, go to infinity, and we're going to need k over n to go to 0. Okay. So in the 50s, it was shown that this is consistent under this continuity assumption. Uh, k nearest neighbor is consistent in Euclidean space. And, um, and in the 60s, it was shown by Cover and Hart that you, under, under this condition, you also get consistency in any metric space. And the argument is very um, elementary. I'll just step through it quickly. Okay. So you get a query point. And now let's take our end data points and just order them by increasing distance from the query. Okay. Now, um, <coughs> The training points all come from this underlying distribution. So if you look at any ball in space, the expected number of points that fall in that ball is just n times the probability mass of the ball. Okay, uh, Expected number of points, and then you can give some sort of concentration results. And what that means is that if you look at the k nearest neighbors, they lie in a ball centered at x of probability mass about k over n. Okay, So the k nearest neighbors lie in a ball of probability mass k over n. And since k over n is going to 0 as n goes to infinity, the ball is getting smaller and smaller. Okay? And what that means is that your k nearest neighbors are getting closer and closer to x. And by continuity, the biases of those k nearest neighbors are getting closer and closer to the bias of x. So as n goes to infinity, you're basically getting, um, you're taking the weighted vote of, you're, you're, you're taking a majority vote over k coins that have the same bias as x. And so um, by the law of large numbers, you get the right label. OK, does that make sense? It's a nice, simple argument. Uh, and this is, this is why you have consistency under continuity. So the next breakthrough came in the 70s. And this was, uh, you know, this was just a remarkable, you know, at the time, this was uh, very much uh, thought of as like a, a remarkable result for non-parametric estimation where without any sort of continuity assumptions, without any assumptions on the distribution, um, uh, consistency was established. And this was, again, in Euclidean space. And it was called universal consistency. Universal meaning no assumptions. Okay? So uh, let me tell you how this goes. Okay? So because uh, this, yeah. Um, so again, now we have some arbitrary eta. Okay? But what that means is that um, we have some eta that's continuous almost everywhere. Okay? So we, apart from some epsilon fraction of the space, there is a continuous function that agrees with eta. Okay? Um, and so we just need to worry about these bad, these bad areas. Okay? So how much trouble can these regions cause us, the, um, the, 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 the regions where this continuous approximation does not hold? Okay? So the problem is that a bunch of training points will lie in here, okay? Since this uh, has probabil probability mass uh, epsilon, roughly epsilon n points will lie in here. So quite a lot of points will lie in here. And these points can have a very bad effect if they end up being the nearest neighbor of the query. If one of these is the nearest neighbor of the query, then things are then we're in trouble. And so the real question is, if you look at one of these bad points, how many points can it be the nearest neighbor of? And so it all boiled down to this one uh, geometric question. And so the question was, pick a finite set of points in RP. Okay, Look at any one point. Can it be the nearest neighbor of everything else? How many points can it be the nearest neighbor of? And it turned out what Stone noticed is that you can only be the nearest, any given point can only be the nearest neighbor of a constant number of other points of 5 to the p other points, OK? And then that made everything OK, OK? That means that these bad regions over here only have a constant, you know, that you just get epsilon times a constant bad stuff going on. And as epsilon goes to 0, everything is fine. So you're using k, you're averaging over k. Doesn't that even make those bad areas less relevant? Or like yeah, so that's, um, so I'll talk about that next. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's something that, that came a bit later, yeah. Yeah, this is just consistency. So this is just n goes to infinity. Yeah. Yeah. N is yeah. So this is here. Yeah, n, n is going to infinity. So it's yeah. And and n is just getting. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so, uh, so let me just briefly uh, 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 just explain this real. So, so the idea is you have any finite set of points, and now you look at one of them. And you say, how many of the other points can have this as their nearest neighbor? And the answer is, at most, five to the dimension. OK, why? Because what you do is you look at a bunch of cones subtended at that point. OK, so look at cones that are very thin, like maybe an angle of 30 degrees. So look at these thin cones and cover all of space with those cones. How many cones do you need? About 5 to the d. Since each cone has got a constant angle, the number of cones you need is some constant to the dimension. And now within each cone, the cones themselves are so narrow that within each cone, only one of the points in that cone can have this at its nearest neighbor, this closest point. The next point in the cone will have this as a closer neighbor. OK, so that was the argument. Does it make sense? So that was. Um, and, and that's what enabled um, the generalization from uh, continuous to arbitrary. This was what Stone's argument was based on. Okay? Now, what we want to do is to uh, do this for metric spaces. And this doesn't look like the kind of argument that this doesn't look like something that's going to uh, fly in metric spaces. And so uh, we, we adopted a somewhat different approach. Okay? And so um, let me just step through that. OK, so now again, we have a query point x. And now let's sort the points uh, uh, by increasing distance from x. And previously, what we said is that under continuity, um, as n goes to infinity, the biases of, the k of, the, of those k nearest neighbors are going to approach the bias of x. So each of those k nearest neighbors will have bias roughly the same as that of x. But we don't need that for the law of large numbers. We only need it to be the case that the average bias of those k coins becomes the bias of x. We don't need each of them individually to have the same bias as x. So we just need the average bias, OK? So if they lie in some, so let's say the k nearest neighbors lie in some ball of radius r, you can think of them as random draws from that ball, from the underlying distribution restricted to that ball. And so the average bias is close to simply the average value of eta in that ball. That's what the average bias is close to. And as n goes to infinity, this ball is getting smaller and smaller. And so what we want is the limit as r goes to 0 um, of this average bias to be eta of x. And this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, This is just the standard differentiation condition. Okay, So this is all we need. And so basically, we get consistency in any metric space for which this holds. Um, and so that was, um, OK. And, um, and I, I don't personally have a clear sense of what those, I know sometimes it holds, sometimes it doesn't. But for example, it holds in any doubling metric measure space, OK? Um, in, in, in spaces where, you know, as you, um, as you look at a ball and you double the radius of the ball, the measure uh, goes up by at most um, a constant factor. Okay, so this is a, a more general uh, um, approach to consistency. Okay, so that was uh, that was the first uh, set of results about consistency. Any any questions about that? Okay, so uh, so now uh, let's get to rates of convergence under smoothness, and then rates of convergence without any kind of smoothness at all. So as you said, in, in non-parametric estimation, um, uh, there are various smoothness conditions on the underlying distribution that are formulated. And I'll just go through what the typical conditions are. The first is that this eta function is Lipschitz or has some sort of Holder condition like this. Okay, um, Very standard sort of condition. The second is a little bit more interesting. Okay. So the first is just saying that eta doesn't uh, jump up and down too quickly. Okay? What the second condition is saying is basically that um, if you look at regions where um, eta is close to a half, over there you need a lot of neighbors to figure out which side of a half you're on. Okay? Um, in a sense, they're troublesome regions. Okay? Um, whereas if you look at... Um, points that are closer, where eta is close to 1 or close to 0, it's much, you can figure out much more quickly which, uh, which side you're on. So uh, there's some so they're qualitatively different, these two regimes. Okay? And so let's look at the region where eta lies in the range half plus or minus t. Uh, 
and we'll simply insist that the probability mass of such points is not too much. Okay, so if you look at, uh, you'll think uh, we can think of it as a width t margin around the decision boundary. The decision boundary is basically the points for which eta is exactly a half, and you can think of the width t margin around the boundary is the points for which eta is in the range uh, a half minus t to a half plus t, and we're going to hope that that's not too large. Okay. No, this is just the probability mass of x for which, uh, in, in that region. The probability mass of, of x near the boundary. Overall. Overall, yeah, the overall probability mass is, is bounded. So this is the second assumption. And, um, and what it was found, it was found by Odibert and Sibakov that um, under these two conditions, so now you are summarizing the underlying distribution by just two parameters alpha and beta, and also the dimension t. So the distribution itself might be very complicated, but you've boiled it down to just three numbers, alpha, beta, and p. And if those are the only things that you're use, allowed to use in your formula, then you cannot hope for a better rate than this. Okay. So if you have to give a formula solely in terms of alpha, beta, and p, this is, what, this is the best thing you can hope for. Okay? And Um, yeah, you can you know you can take it as zero. You can take it as um, yeah. So, um, but this, so this is considered sort of the minimax uh, rate of convergence, and uh, these people also showed that there are some estimators that can attain this rate. And then we found that nearest neighbor also does this. Okay. Um, the nice thing about these the the sort of dirty secret about these optimal rates is. Just about anything reasonable attains the optimal rate, so it's not a big surprise that nearest neighbor also does. You know, it's it's. But you're still not happy with this rate, right? Or are you? Uh, well, um, I'm not happy with the whole game. You know, with this whole thing where you take a complicated high-dimensional distribution and you boil it down to three numbers, and you say well, we have to give a rate in terms of those three numbers, the rate's going to be meaningless. You know that's uh, that's the part I'm not happy with. But as far as the, you know, as as far as the, um, uh, you know, as far as this goes, it's a nice theory and so on. You know, that's 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 all fine. Um, <coughs> okay, so 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 that was this, and then um, so we wanted to to actually get better rates, so rates that are really fine tuned to the specific distribution at hand, and you do need the smoothness condition. Um, and so the first thing we did was to try and come up with a smoothness condition that is appropriate for nearest neighbor, and I'll tell you what I mean. Okay? So the usual smoothness conditions, things like Lipschitz and so on, will say, okay, let's measure how quickly eta is changing. So we'll relate the difference between eta x and eta uh, x prime to x minus x prime. It'll relate it to that length. But for nearest neighbor, absolute lengths don't matter at all. You can take all lengths and multiply them by 10, and nearest neighbor remains actually exactly the same. So what matters for nearest neighbor is not the length, x, mi x minus x prime, but the probability mass that lies between x and x prime. That's the relevant quantity for nearest neighbor. And so we wanted to give a smoothness assumption where we would quantify the change from eta x to eta x prime in terms of the probability mass of this interval. Okay. And so we just gave an analog of that holder smoothness condition. Uh, uh, you know, that we took that same condition and we just rewrote it using these probability masses. So we said that look at any point x and now grow a ball of radius r around it. Look at the average eta in that ball. The difference between these two should depend not on the radius r, but on the probability mass of that ball. And then again, you have that same uh, sort of coefficient alpha. Okay, so this is the this is a version of a similar assumption that's now not in terms of actual distances in the metric space, but probability masses. And this, in in that sense, it's more appropriate for nearest neighbor. And it turns out that this little change makes a lot of the analysis much simpler. Okay, because it really is better suited for nearest neighbor. And you know, under the under conditions of previous work on non-parametric estimation, the conditions they had actually boiled down to the same, you know, um, you know, imply that this condition also holds. Okay. Okay. So with this condition, what kind of bounds can you give? 
So, um, OK. So let me, um, so now you can give bounds that hold for the specific distribution as long as it is alpha smooth in that sense. OK, so let's say that you have a distribution that's alpha smooth, according to that notion that I just mentioned. Then you can show the following upper and lower bounds. The error rate of the nearest neighbor classifier is upper bounded by this, and it's lower bounded by this. Okay, And both upper and lower bounds look a lot like this. It's basically look at the region of space whose bias, whose eta of x is between a half minus 1 over square root k to a half plus 1 over square root k. And just look at the probability mass of that window. And that's basically what the error rate is. You know, and there's like a little delta here and some other constant there. But that's, um, and so this is, you know, it's a, it's a rate that's a little bit, that's, that's accurate because for the specific distribution, there is very close upper and lower bounds. Okay? It's not nice to look at, like, you know, n to the minus 1 over 1,000. But it's, um, it's more accurate. Okay? And uh, it's, very, it's very simple to uh, obtain this. Okay. Um, so, any questions about that? Wait, so. It's so. Yeah, so now, so now um, it's, it's, um, it actually all depends on what fraction of points lie in this boundary region. So there isn't really a clear formula in terms of, you know, like does it have to be polynomial in dimension or exponential in dimension? So it's, uh, you know. And the lower bound holds for any choice of k? Yes. The lower bound holds for any choice of k. Um, yeah, so this is the, the relevant term. So look at all points whose bias is a half plus or minus 1 over square root k. And what is the probability mass of those points? And intuitively, that is what the error of k nearest neighbor should be. It's not, you know, it's, uh, OK. And, and the way you get the previous result is just by translating that to the, you know, setting with, uh, under that condition on the, OK. So, um, so I won't go into the particular details. It's actually a very straightforward argument. Um, you know, uh, it's just a different type of, um, uh, you know, it's just that this sort of um, reasoning was not commonly used in this literature because uh, most people working in this field thought of regression as being the central problem rather than classification. And that demanded something a little bit different. And then when you imported those techniques to classification, you ended up doing something a little different. And so. Anyway, so for somebody starting from classification, this seems to be like much more natural approach. Yeah, I'm not sure if you told the audience what regression is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so regression is where the y is a, continue, is, is, uh, is a real number. And so then it's not, you know, am I right or wrong, but it's like how far, what is the, the uh, how far am I from the, OK. Yeah. No, it would, it would fit here. So what this is saying is that you look at any point x, OK? And now you grow a ball around it of radius r. And you compare the bias at x to the average bias within that ball. And somehow it should be bounded by the probability mass of the ball. So as you grow a ball, uh, you know, as you grow a ball around x, the amount by which the bias changes should depend not on the radius of the ball, but the probability mass of the ball. It's literally just a direct. Uh, translation of that, of that idea. OK. But, but alpha can be anything. It's not. Alpha is just any constant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, alpha no, is. Wait, so you, you just said yeah. Yeah. Alpha is, alpha is any constant. OK. OK, so now I'll talk about um, 
Um, so in doing this, um, you know, in, 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 in looking at, in, in, in trying to come up with those results, um, uh, there was a, you know, the, we, were, we were fairly happy with them, but um, they were still a little messier than we liked because of a certain interaction between K and M. Um, you have this, you have to choose how many neighbors K, and um, it turns out that's not an easy thing to do. Um, and so let me explain why. There are, there are these weird trade-offs in choosing the number of neighbors. So suppose um, your data lies on the line, and the biases of the coins look like this, something like this. So now look at a region like this. Here, the bias of the coin is very close to zero. Easy case, OK? So you should just need a few neighbors. Like two or three neighbors, you're all set, OK? And in fact, if you pick too many neighbors, you might run into trouble, because you might overlap with there. So here, you really want a small k. Now in this region over here, um, the bias is much closer to a half. If you pick two or three neighbors, there's a good chance you're going to end up on the wrong side. So you really want k to be large. And so this is a weird trade-off. There are regions of space in which you really want to just use a few neighbors. And there are other regions in which you want to use a lot of neighbors. And so what do you do about this? Well, you know, and, and so somehow this was coming into the bounds. It was making things uh, a little messier than they should be. And then, so we said, hey, you know, well, why do we have to commit to the same k everywhere? Let's just do it adaptively. Uh, and, uh, and so let me show you the algorithm that we, that we came up with then. So now you have a training set again, and you, you do have a confidence parameter. And the confidence parameter is you say, OK, uh, my confidence parameter is going to be 95%. That means there's a 5% chance that things are going to go wrong. But OK, so that's, a, that's a common from randomized algorithms. And so now what you do to make a prediction at x, you grow a ball around it. You look at the one nearest neighbor, two nearest neighbor, k nearest neighbor, and you keep growing the ball until the bias of the ball is significant, until the very first time that ball has got significant bias. You, know, you get 10 points, and eight of them are plus. That's significant, or you know, something like that. So you wait for the first time, the first value of k, which the bias of the ball is sufficiently far away from a half, away from a half by 1 over square root k, standard sort of uh, central limit theorem type of bounds. Okay. Now, if there is, it might be the case that you never get that. You know, you keep growing the ball, and it's always just a half, a half, a half. Okay. In which case, you just return question mark. You say, honestly, I don't know. Okay. But if you ever get such a ball, then you stop and you make a prediction. Okay. So this is sort of a, an adaptive setting of k where you, you set it based. Um, uh, and this is meant to overcome that problem I was showing, which was later. So let me tell you the kind of bounds you get then. Um, you actually get some very, I'll just put them all, all up since, um, OK. So um, <laughs> under this setting, you can give a much cleaner sort of bound. Okay, So what you can show is that there is a margin. There's a notion of a margin where um, it's a function um, that assigns a value to every point in space, which basically summarizes how easy that query point is. Okay, so for every point in space, you assign it a number, uh, saying how easy it is. And uh, so, and I'll tell you what that number is exactly. But but then once you've assigned that number, what you can show is that as soon as the training set size exceeds one over the margin, you're going to predict okay at that point. Okay, so. Each point has got this margin, and you're gradually increasing the size of the training set. And the minute it increases, it, the minute it um, shoots past one over the margin, then you're likely to predict correctly over there. Um, and if it's below, then who knows? Okay. So what is the margin? Uh, so I'll just I'll just go through this definition over here. So um, we'll take a we'll look at a point, and we'll say that it's p gamma salient if the following properties hold. Okay. Let's say the point has got a label. Uh, let's say the point has eta greater than a half. The case less than a half is symmetric. Let's say eta is greater than a half. What we need it to be the case is that as you grow a ball around x, you're going to grow a ball up to probability mass p. So as you grow a ball of probability mass p around x, the average bias is consistency, consistently greater than a half. Okay. So you, so for uh, for all balls up to probability mass around uh, up to probability mass p around x, the bias is greater than a half. And 
at probability mass p, the bias is a half plus gamma, is at least a half plus gamma. Okay? So the bias at x might be you know, 0.51, and then you grow the ball and it's 0 0.51, 0 0.51, 0 0.51, 0 0.56, and then that gamma is 0.04. Okay? So, uh, so that's the p and gamma. And now the margin is simply the supremum for the margin at x is simply the supremum of p gamma squared over all p and gamma, such that x is p gamma salient. Okay? So x is going to be, any point x is going to be p gamma salient for many different pairs p and gamma. And uh, look at the best case. Okay? So look at the supremum of those. Uh, and that's going to give you the margin at x. And so this is a non-parametric notion of margin. So for parametric classifiers like linear separators and so on, um, it's been useful to define um, the margin of a linear separator, which is sort of the, the width around the boundary where there's no data. Okay? And it's been possible to give rates in terms of the margin. For non-parametrics, it makes sense that the margin would not be a single number, but would actually be a function over the entire space, which tells you how easy it is to predict at any individual point. And um, is yeah. there a assumption on, on the uh, um, on here? No, no, here there isn't. Yeah. So this is just uh, so so. Um, although this is a slightly different predictor, this also has the same. Uh, universal consistency in metric spaces under the differentiation condition, under the, um, under the Lebesgue differentiation condition. The differentiation part here, right? Every ball is with mass less than p. Yeah, so, kind of right. So um, all we are saying, though, is that uh, the, the key thing is we are looking at the average um, we're looking at the average over the ball, and that's what you get from the differentiation condition. Because, you know, the differentiation so condition every is... Every ball less than that mass. Yeah, but the differentiation condition tells you that if you look at balls shrinking to x, um, that limit goes to uh, eta of x. So it does hold for, uh, for, for every ball of uh, a certain, you know, of, of a sufficiently small radius. No, but Be why is that not a Yeah, so this is, um, this is uh, you, right, so we're using the average um, mass of the, of the yeah. Yeah, 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 mass, yeah. Okay, so that was the, so this is um, our more recent result. And, okay, so in terms of open problems, um, yeah. Sorry, just a question about that last thing. If I were interested in uh, integrated error rather than some pointwise uh, quantities, is there a way to say what this does over my whole space? Yeah, so then what you would have to do is that um, um, you would basically, you know, because what this is saying is that once the data set size exceeds this, then so what you would have to say is, what is the probability mass of x whose margin is greater than or equal to? You know, if you, would, you would have to look at, you would have to do that. Okay, what is the probability mass of all the x's whose margin is greater than, you know, 0.5 or greater than 0.1? And then that would give you the kind of, Okay, and then you know when, when n exceeds that, then all of those points are correctly classified, and then you don't know about the others. Yeah. Um, so what you're suggesting here is a way that you can do your adaptive over k. One can also think about the adaptivity instead of giving equal weights to all points, giving different weights. So I'm, I'm wondering. I think there's work by Richard Samuels and others. So is that related or? Um, yes, so there is, um, right, yeah, so there's a very uh, interesting literature uh, uh, on assigning weights to different points. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, and, and would, you know, so, so that's something that is, you know, in my view, somewhat more sophisticated than this. And so I would be interested in sort of trying to analyze those schemes using, um, you know, a similar sort of, uh, you know, similar types of analysis. Yeah, but I, I haven't thought about that at all. And another question. Um, I mean, from practitioner's point of view, uh, if I apply your method, I'd like to, here's a here's point X, I'd like to know how confident I am that I am giving the right prediction. Is your methodology allow such a statement? Or? Um, 
it doesn't uh, it uh, right. Unfortunately, not. Uh, and 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 the reason for that is that you know, um, although the method considers itself con confident, it, it's going to grow the ball you know until it gets to a point where it's confident. Ultimately, um, you know, it's like the unknown unknown. It could easily be the case that there isn't enough data. And so, in fact, there's a very small ball around the query point where the label is completely different. And it just has no idea. So it cannot actually assign confidences that are meaningful in that way. You know, it's, so the sort of confidence it can say is that, you know, I am 95% uh, confident that either this label is correct or there is a tiny ball around the query, around the specific query that has the opposite label. That this is a point, you know, that this is the point where the eta function changes a lot. So which is where reasonable to think about that? Like nearby point where it Yeah, but you know, a lot of the kind of aesthetic in non-parametrics is just a kind of, yeah. Worst case. worst case, you know, don't, don't, you know, it's like we don't want to assume anything. And so, yeah, so, 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 so there, but there is a one, one statement like that one could give. OK, so in terms of open problems, one thing I'm very interested in doing is exploring this experimentally. Because uh, something that's been observed is transforming the representation of the data can make nearest neighbor perform much better. So if you're looking at images in the original image space, nearest neighbor might be very bad. But then you use a neural net to transform the space, and all of a sudden, nearest neighbor works much better. And it would be nice to see. Uh, what happens to these margins? You know, like is, the, is this reflected somehow in the margin that uh, somehow the margins become much bigger? It's a, it's a representation that uh, you know jacks up the margin. The second thing is, you know, as I said, um, although this is in metric spaces, it would be um, very interesting to also look at more general kinds of distances, and uh, you know, and, and how to formulate that, and um, yeah. That's a, that's a very interesting question. People, people often use things like, for example, the relative entropy or KL divergence, which neither satisfies the triangle inequality nor is symmetric. Um, okay. um, the third one is that the nice thing about nearest neighbor is that um, it really doesn't matter what the labels are. You, know, you can use the same data set to solve many different classification problems on the same space. You know, you have a space of patients. And in one case, you're interested in whether they're going to respond well to treatment. In another case, you're interested in some other question. In the third case, you're interested in some other. You know, there can be many different questions you're interested in. And you just run the same procedure on the same data set. You just find similar patients and kind of extrapolate from that. And so you can sort of support multiple classification problems on the same data set. And for that reason, it would be interesting to expend, extend this to um, basically arbitrary label spaces. So just some sort of um, innumerable label space. Uh, and then finally, once you have convergence rates, then you can use this for um, other kinds of machine learning problems like active learning and domain adaptation. OK, so I would like to thank uh, all my co-authors. And uh, that's all.